from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm back home again in London after having spent 10 days in Birmingham for the Commonwealth Games. And of course, Cricket T20 for the women was featuring for the first time Cricket making a return from its first appearance in 1998. That was a one-off with the men. But yeah, managed to get out and see a little bit of beach volleyball as well, a bit of gymnastics. Um, wasn't much gap in between cricket matches because they came thick and fast. But Jim, delighted for you that the Aussies came top of the podium. England didn't even make one, two or three. Yes, Australia had a, a wonderful time and uh, I, I did take in as much as I could with the time difference. And the very exciting performances by a number of the Australians. You have to mention the cricket, which we will, but uh, the performance by that guy Oliver Hoare in the 1500 metres final was just extraordinary, extraordinary. Anyway, it's still wintry down here, although I had my first cricket meeting for the new season uh, last night. So we're starting to think and talk a little bit more about the game as we move towards uh, September and the start of it all. Hello everyone, I'm Charu Sharma for All India Radio. I'm in Mysore, one of the more livable cities in the country. Very clean, very nice. What am I doing here? Well, we've rechristened our Karnataka T20 tournament, uh, one of the premier domestic T20 tournaments from the Karnataka Premier League, which had a bit of a wobble some years ago, to the Maharaja Trophy, which makes sense because it's all about the Mysore Maharaja and that's where cricket started in Karnataka, by the way. So uh, I empathize with you, uh, Alison, because it's been thick and fast here. Double headers every day and of course, <laughs> accompanied by rain because we're in the of the monsoon so everything gets delayed and i'm home by midnight but it's still great fun and one of the co-commentators i have is veda krishnamurti who played for india uh, you might remember her and uh, so yeah. it's uh, well we, we sit and lament together about what might have been in that final which india was about to win enough of this generosity and hospitality and we allowed australia to win once again well, we're going to talk more about the commonwealth games right now because australia's domination of the women's game continues and they are Commonwealth Games champions. That is in addition to being the holders of the Ashes and world champions in both the T20 and ODI formats of the game. So how did it feel for a cricketer to stand on a podium at a Commonwealth Games? Well, I put that question to Australia fast bowler Megan Shute. It was absolutely incredible. Um, I didn't really know what to expect coming into the Com Games and if I'm honest, I, I didn't at the time, hold it very high in terms of, like, it's not close to a World Cup. I was like, it'll be great if we win gold, but if we don't, I won't be overly disappointed. And then once the game kicked off, and obviously, I mean, competitive spirit kicks in, but to actually stand on the podium and have the national anthem play after you've received a medal rather than before the game and see all the fans that stayed for the medal ceremony, um, it was phenomenal. And it was actually made me a little bit emotional, um, way more than what I thought. So that was really cool. And what is it about this side which is making you that decent side and, and a little bit more, a little bit better than decent even? Uh, I just think we scrap well. Um, we're, we get along tremendously. I think that's a unique part is there is absolutely no risk in the team and, and we are so blessed because naturally there kind of can be that, especially in female teams, but none of that. And the core of our group has been together for a very long time now. Um, some real senior heads there. So there's a lot of experience, but I think when the going gets tough, we don't really pick on each other. And that's a, that's a big noticeability difference that we see um, with other sides is, you know, when things get heated and drop catches or misfields, they, they tend to take it out on each other. And we pride ourselves on making sure we don't do that. So um, that doesn't help anyone. No one means to, you know, mess up in cricket. So I feel like that goes a long way, especially in those tight situations. And you had a quite unusual situation, didn't you, in the lead up to the final, literally in the hours before, because Tiny McGrath had a positive COVID test and she was cleared to play. But how did that all unfold from your perspective? Yeah, oh, look, I mean, we found out not long before we left for the match. Um, good on Talia for testing. I mean, like, I think that would be a big difference between um, someone in our squad versus anyone else in any of the villages is no one was testing. There were no protocols and we were the only team that were just by the Kiwis wearing masks in the hotel. So it's kind of like fitting that the one team that had COVID protocols are the one team that tested positive throughout the tournament. But we almost scrapped, we almost got through it without a positive COVID case and it just happened to fall on that day. And honestly, I just feel for Talia. She just wanted to play cricket, didn't want any of the headlines that came with it. And yeah, there's a bit of salty fans out there, but they're always going to be. And Meg Lanning, we've just learned, is now taking an indefinite break 
from the game. We don't know when she's going to return. Did you have any inkling of that during the Commonwealth Games? Not really. I mean, Meg is Meg. She's such a professional head and she shows that no matter what. And, yeah, for her to kind of come out and, and do something for herself, I'm actually super, super proud of her. Um, that would have taken a lot of guts and, yeah, hopefully she enjoys that time and, and really looks after herself. Yeah, is it sort of symptomatic that there's actually, you know, an awful lot of women's cricket now that, you know, you guys do need to take breaks at times and notably you know, a couple of the New Zealand players, even, you know, before the Commonwealth Games had taken sort of mental health breaks. But is that a, a, a good thing? I mean, is, is the game struggling with a balance at where it is at the moment with the amount of cricket on offer? How do you see it? It's a tough one because everyone handles it differently, I guess, but I mean, it shows that we are playing a lot of cricket, which is exactly what we've asked for. Um, mm. I think the the real beauty of it is that all those players are supported in that time. And I mean, people in real life jobs do the same thing. They, you know, take time off work and are supported by their employers. So I think as long as everyone um, takes care of each other, it's, it's a sustainable product. I mean, being a professional sports person is only a short career anyway. So if you have to take little breaks here and there to make sure you're taking care of your mental health that kicks on your career for a couple of years longer than you imagined, then um, so be it. And I imagine it's probably going to be more in the future. That was Australia fast bowler Megan Shoot. So turned out that the, the Jim Maxwell Cherry Sharma derby ended up being <laughs> going the way of Maxwell's Australia. I mean, Jim, what more can be said about this team? Because they are phenomenal, aren't they? Phenomenal, yes, but they were tested certainly by India on two occasions uh, during this tournament, and uh, they've shown their resilience, depth in batting. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to question much about this Australian team, even if they have a lapse or two. They haven't got the ability to, to recover because of their experience and their skill, and uh, it just keeps shining. And I think for, for those involved in this team, they call it Team Australia, uh, getting a gold medal, the first one ever at a Commonwealth Games for a women's team in cricket, is um, an extraordinary triumph and one of the more memorable, I, I would say, uh, victories that Australia's had, given they've had quite a few of them. Uh, as we move on, uh, it will be really strongly remembered if not already by the players for for what they have done because uh, there'll be a few of these players who won't be at the next Commonwealth Games assuming cricket is going to be played and you would think in regional Victoria it it works in perfectly Um, but uh, this is an extraordinary team. Yep you know it felt quite pointed I thought when Megan Shute said there in that interview about just how together the Australians are and stressing that they you know don't take things out on each other when things start to go wrong because it was quite pointed that the England team seemed to get a bit ratty. Catherine Brunt in particular got herself a, a reprimand from the ICC, an official reprimand um, for a audible obscenity when a catch was dropped off her bowling you know, by, by the youngster Freya Kemp as well. And you know, Catherine Brunt is brilliant when the passion's firing and she's taking wickets and, and things are going well. And She's been an awesome leader of England's attack for so many years. She's one who, you know, I think she she knew that this was her one shot at a Commonwealth Games gold. And whether she decides to retire or whether she sees through the English summer or whether there's another carrot, another tilt of a trophy at the T20 World Cup early next year in South Africa, uh, we'll, we'll wait to see. There's a new England coach who will be needed, won't there? Because Lisa Kitely, the Aussie, has now said she's stepping down at the end of this England summer. Maybe that would be a juncture for, again, a bit of a, a new start with those newer names taking over from somebody like Catherine Brunt. But yeah, I thought it was quite an interesting comment that Megan Shute made. Charu, I commentated on the, the medal ceremony. And as regards India, I did make the point when the players stepped forward onto the podium that perhaps with more investments, India could be top of the podium one day. And actually, the India captain, Harman Preet Kaur, said after the final that, you know, women's IPL could be the turning point that would then start to turn these second places and silver medals into trophies and golds. Do you agree? Well, she could well be right. But let's not forget that India ran Australia very, very close in both the matches in the league stage as well as the final. And, Mm. you know, with a little more experience, you're right, they should have won because there were matches that they actually conspired to lose India. They were in winning positions both those matches. So there are a lot of good things going on in Indian women's cricket. And by the way, it attracted a lot of attention here in India, the Commonwealth Games, the women progressing to the final. But there's a little flaw in that theory because do remind me who won the World T20 sometime back? Uh, wasn't the West Indies? 
girls. They, they did in 2016. Right. They don't have a West Indies mm-hmm. IPL. And, and uh, you know, England won. They didn't have the 100 or whatever else uh, in, in all the rest of the leagues. Then they won the 2017 World Cup. So it's not all down to a women's IPL. Uh, Australia no weren't as established the... then either, though. I'll just say that. Well, there you go. Yeah, there you go. So the, the women's IPL, of course, is a very important milestone, a benchmark that needs to be reached as quickly as possible. But I don't think that's the primary reason why the Indians lost uh, all these tournaments in the past. It's just a little something missing, maybe a, a late middle order kind of surge that they need with the batting. You can talk about more cricketing aspects, but uh, I think she has expressed on behalf of all the rest of the cricketers that they are ready for a women's IPL. We on Stumped have been talking about it for years. Uh, I just think that the commercials need to come together. Uh, because at least the Indian world of cricket is very obsessed about uh, the whole commercial angle. So perhaps this uh, effort at the Commonwealth Games, the silver medal effort, might in fact uh, fast track the process for women's IP. But let's not forget that for it to be attractive, uh, you need more in the pyramid playing a higher level of cricket because Sometimes, if it comes too soon, it might work against uh, a women's IPL where if the standards are not uniformly high for the four or six or eight teams at uh, first start, then it might lead to a little bit of cynicism. I, I've said that before as well. So we just, you know, I, I think events will conspire. The universe will conspire to make it happen at the right time. So, Ali, you were at the Commonwealth Games. What did the fans uh, make of it? Do they enjoy it? Yeah, I'd say so. There was a pretty enthousi- enthusiastic atmosphere at all the matches. Um, curiously, the Commonwealth Games make it their policy not to release individual crowd numbers per match. Um, but they did put out that, well, initially more than 150,000 tickets were sold. That's since gone up to 160,000, I've seen reported, across just 16 matches. So that actually beats overall the numbers of tickets that were sold for the T20 World Cup in Australia two and a half years ago. And I understand that around 17,500 were at the gold medal match. And even the neutral matches were well supported. And in terms of, when I say neutral, sort of non-England being the the host nation. Um, And from the reaction of the crowd, the cheering, the clapping, it felt as if there were those knowledgeable cricket fans who were applauding certain nuances of the game. And there were also new cricket fans who were clapping and cheering so enthusiastically, you know, even when a team was limping towards the finish line and were, you know, certain for defeat. So I think in that sense, it would have to go down as a success. But of course, we all know, you know that in England, cricket is a known game. And in Australia, if the Games goes to regional Victoria, it will be a known game. In terms of other games... It'd be interesting to see what happens if the Games is, say, hosted in a country that doesn't have big cricket facilities. You know, can cricket grounds just be built? Is there the know-how around pitches, etc.? So that would be interesting to see, certainly. Um, but in terms of people attending, I think at a Games like that and indeed Olympics, because a lot of the success of cricket at the Commonwealth is thought to go a long way as to whether the ICC can get cricket into the Olympics – I think that there will always be good crowds because, as I mentioned at the start, I went to watch beach volleyball. Um, I went to gymnastics. I would have gone to the weightlifting if I had a chance because at the Games, you find yourself just keen to watch any sport and sometimes more so the sports you don't usually see. So in that sense, yeah, cricket absolutely is widened out to a broader audience. Well, now on Stumped, we've had the very sad news this week that former South African umpire Rudy Kurtzen died suddenly at the age of 73 after a car accident. He retired from umpiring in 2010 following a career that saw him officiate in 332 internationals. And there's been loads of tributes from all over the world pouring in from the likes of Rinda Sewag and Ricky Ponting, Wazim Akram. He was so well respected I mean, I knew him more professionally rather than personally from being on the, the international cricket circuit. He was just somebody who was always very, well, a lot of umpires are very affable, aren't they? And he always had a word if you bumped into him in the lift or a chat over the breakfast buffet in a hotel. Um, Jim, I wonder what your memories of, of Rudy Kurtzen are. Rudy Kurtzen, I think he put that little place called Nizna on the map in the South Africa, but I remember having a few chats to him. He was a fairly direct South African in the way he conducted himself and uh, issued his opinions on the game, but it was more the signature of that slow arm, remember, (laughs) going... Like a drawbridge. The finger (laughs) of death, drawing the gun out of the holster and going, bang, you're out. Um, So, yes, those sort of mannerisms, as we've seen with people like uh, Billy Bowden, 
uh, have left their <laughs> mark. But um, yeah, a Rusty very confident Rusty sounds like umpire. a fan as well, I have to say, <laughs> in the background. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, he's, applaud- he's <laughs> applauding. <laughs> Charity, he, yeah. he was. It became an iconic sort of umpire, didn't he? I guess maybe because of that, the, the slow finger of death, as it became known. Perhaps that, but to my mind, much more because of his uh, personality, his demeanor. He was truly very friendly with the players. Not all umpires are, as Jim said, but I think he was. He was genuinely w- friendly. And, 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 and happy to be a part of the game. There was not a negative bone in his body. He was, as you said, you'd meet everyone, whatever it was, and have an exchange a word or two. We've had, of course, plenty of meets as well in the international cricket circuit. And I always found him to be very friendly, not just with all of us, the whole universe, but with the players as well. Of course, Virendra Sawag, as you mentioned, has sent out a tribute where Rudy Kurtzman used to often, well, not admonish, but certainly meet him on the field and said, don't play that shot. We like to watch you. So <laughs> watch what you play. We stay as long <laughs> as you can. Uh, which was obviously an indication that I'm quite happy to be neutral, but I also like watching good cricket. Um, I suppose, you know, umpires do retire and maybe they can carry on longer. We had on stump to remember somebody who was umpiring at the age of 85, so perhaps he could have gone on a bit. But a very friendly personality and, and of course, a, a bit of a legend in the umpiring world. We shared some wonderful, you know, happy times together and, I mean, our thoughts and obviously go out to the rest of his family because it's a little premature and, and it just was, you know, accidents are a horrible way to go. But Rudy, you gave us lots of very memorable moments uh, in and around the cricket field. Yeah, very sad indeed. And for England cricket fans, they will remember he and Billy Bowden walking out to the middle famously at the climax of the 2005 Ashes when the final day had been affected by rain and bad light and they had to ceremonially ceremonially remove the bales from the stumps to signify the end of the match, which brought about England's historic Ashes victory. So Rudy Kurtzson, very fondly remembered. Well, that is it for this week's Stumped. Thanks to Jim Maxwell and Charis Sharma, and of course to you for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.